Merrill, and I'm one, very delighted today to present a panel on uh, accessibility. It's called App Applications for All, the Need for Digital Accessibility. I hope everyone enjoyed Alan Miles' keynote. Around here, we call him the CEO, the Chief Energy Officer, and uh, him being around is like a shot of caffeine, like everyone said in the comments. Uh, so it was great, great way to kick the day off. And now I want to talk about accessibility and its importance in the world that we we live in. A couple of statistics I want to read off to you from our Every Experience Matters survey that uh, that I think will really start the conversation, and then I'll introduce the panelists. So I didn't know this before when we when we started studying this, but 15% of the world relies on assistive technology in order to accomplish necessary tasks on the internet. And 62% of those who use assistive technology say that they frequently experience errors which prevent them from being able to accomplish a task. And these are not just frivolous tasks like, you know, completing a puzzle. These are actually important things that they need to do in order to live their daily lives. 24% of users who rely on assistive technology devices report abandoning a brand after having a bad experience. So with that in mind, I wanted to introduce today's experts on accessibility and get the conversation started about how you can weave accessibility into your software development practice. So first, first uh, senior D digital accessibility analyst with Salesforce. Crystal. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm a uh, senior digital accessibility analyst at Salesforce. Um, I, a lot of people always ask me what that means, and I am tasked with um, reviewing and making sure that internal digital accessibility for all of our employees and their experiences is, um, you know, good and, and, and accessible. So Yeah, great. And next up, we have Judy Weeder, the senior analyst for Forrester. Judy? Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. I'm a senior analyst for at Forrester in the customer experience research team. Um, as Mark has mentioned, I focus on the areas around establishing funding and scaling a CX practice. But in addition to that, because I've been on the web since 94, building websites way back in the day, um, I have a passion around accessibility and around usability and all things digital. So I've been bringing that into work and I also do digital user experience reviews in addition to the myriad types of reports and, and research that I write. Well, it's great to have you. Um, finally, we have Rochelle Bradley Montgomery, Executive Director and Founder of Accessible Community, uh, Digital Accessibility Specialist with the Library of Congress and the Co-Chair of the Ex Accessibility Guidelines Working Group for the World Wide Web Consortium. Well, good to have you here, Rochelle. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, just to clarify, I'm speaking today for myself and, and none of those organizations that I uh, work for, but really appreciate the chance to be here. That's great. So uh, my name is Marcus Merrill. I'm the Vice President of Technology Strategy for Sauce Labs. I'm also the co-lead of the Accessibility Employee Resource Group here at Sauce Labs along with Mitchell Andre, my co-lead. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm very honored to moderate this panel, and I think it's uh, it's great. So let's get started. I wanted to ask a question for the entire panel. Um, let's start with Crystal because you you, you I I believe you have your hands dirty all the time inside of this topic. Uh, <laughs> when when someone we people often talk about accessibility and usability, and when you're a layperson like like I I am, um, you you tend to think that if my product is usable, then by definition, it's accessible. So Crystal, and with anyone else's participation also, what, what do you think about that, equating those two things? Um, I think in a perfect world, if something is, you know, you know, usability would mean accessibility, but <laughs> we do not live in a perfect world. So, and, you know, when that comes up and a lot of people like i get that question a lot i know the rest of my, my panelists do as well and usability is kind of about overall general your your users needs and expectations of how your platform software works um you know you know is it intuitive it's you know is it simple it, you know can you know um does it you know the the effort to use it is not exceedingly high but when it comes to accessibility accessibility means um and i want to you know make sure because i think accessibility sometimes gets misused is really needs to focus on um people with disabilities using being able to access your products so the thing is is that usability includes accessibility like but um unfortunately a lot of times 
if some, you know, it gets left out and needs to, you know, be brought into overall usability of a product. So that's kind of like, again, perfect world. You know, if something is usable, it's usable for everyone, no matter, um, you know, if they are, if, if they're disabled or not, but <laughs> that yeah. is, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess what I'm wondering, and, and, you know, Judy, Rochelle, I'd love to hear your opinion. If you, so it sounds like if you have a site that passes all the usability checks, it's probably not accessible, but how about a site that passes all the accessibility checks? What is the converse true? Could that be site be said to be usable then? So a usable site isn't necessarily inaccessible because it may already be there. So to Crystal's point, perfect world, like some of those things are there. When, when we do our own digital ex, uh, experience reviews, we're looking at things like how usable is the navigation? How usable is the site search? But then when we think about the accessibility components, that's gonna be things like, can I zoom? Or like one of my favorite things when I was looking at site search, one of the best examples I've ever seen involved not only the real-time filtering and listing of results, but it also had the option for someone to be able to speak their search terms rather than having to type. And so I, I see those kinds of improvements as ways that usability and, and accessibility can intersect with each other rather than having to be kind of like an either or. I don't think that there's a good customer experience where it's an either or scenario. I think they have to go together. And I would argue you can't have a good customer experience if it's inaccessible, period. Mm -hmm. And I completely agree with with both of what you said. And I just want to add a quick clarification because this new word Zoom now has a double meaning. And so when we say Zoom, we mean magnify, not yes, get magnify. into a teleconference. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> well, well noted, yes. <laughs> but that said, um, in my experience, both are absolutely critical, but I tend to think of things as a pyramid. Like you have to build functionality in, and then you have to think about accessibility next. And the reason I put accessibility next is because I found that if you build with accessibility in mind right up front, you do tend to create a more usable experience. That said, completely agree, both are absolutely critical. Then kind of in my pyramid structure in my head, um, usability comes next. And then the UX overall uh, experience kind of is the top of that, that pyramid uh, that really encompasses all of that and all of the interplay between those three elements. That's interesting. That 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 rings true for me. But what I wonder is, are a lot of development company companies and teams finding themselves with that pyramid kind of being inverted at this point? I think it's often missing pieces <laughs> of that pyramid, and that's where the yeah. gaps come in. Um, it, it is so much more efficient and effective to think about usability and accessibility right up front, and it just saves so much time and money long term. Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting is that us, we, we in the test automation field have a, for a long time used accessibility as almost, I guess you'd say, a, a method of instrumenting our application for testability. And by the way, almost by accident, we've made our site somewhat accessible. And then I think for a lot of people, including myself, accessibility becomes the mission and it becomes a passion that we start to pursue in more and more technical ways to make sure that our users are, are satisfied. And I think that I see that spreading kind of like wildfire around the testing industry, as we've seen in the results of the survey, as well as uh, our own customer interactions, which I think is great. We'll get to the implementation part later. But what, what I want to ask you first, I'll start with Rochelle, since you're involved with standards. How do you know when you've you've done it okay my site is now accessible how do you uh, using apply standards to your site uh, in a non-technical and a technical way to make sure that that your site has has conformed to the accessibility standards sure I, I see accessibility very much as a journey it is not there is no absolute end point um, and it's certainly a journey both for people learning it and getting into it but also a journey for developing a site and creating good accessible content um, and some of that is going back to our previous question really tying into the fact that there is this intersection between accessibility and usability so starting from the standards um, trying to pick the most up-to-date standards we've got WCAG 2.1 right now um, and then WCAG 2.2 comes on the horizon. So starting from those, really making sure you're implementing those 
Um, and then once you kind of got to that point, making sure you're taking that next step with usability testing with individuals with disabilities. If you have the resources to integrate those individuals early on during design, development, um, and user testing early, but if you don't, at least at the, you know, making sure that you get that in there somewhere where you're trying to get the feedback because something can be technically accessible, but not really be fully functionally accessible. And you want to create this great experience that brings people back to your sites and to your content. Yeah. So how does that vary by region? So North America or US versus Canada, how, how do you how, how do you uh, differentiate the standards between? Yeah, and they are um, slightly different. I'll, I'll start by saying I think WCAG really does form the foundation for most international standards for accessibility, but how exactly they're used is, is slightly different. So um, you'll see, for example, the US relies a little more heavily on WCAG 2.0 in its standard requirements. Um, when you start looking at Europe, they've already moved to and are pointing to WCAG 2.1. And so if you are using the most, uh, if you're working internationally and you're using the most up-to-date WCAG standards, you're hitting everybody, but you do have slight differences in preferences in um, different or different countries. Uh, just to note a few things, um, in addition to what we often consider the standards, there's a second concept called functional needs that you see in most of the international laws, and there's slight differences there as well. And so it might be called performance needs, it might be called um, functional needs, but it really is uh, around this concept of, are you supporting an individual who is blind? Are you supporting an individual with low vision? And some of the, the legal space, like for example, includes individuals with seizures and some don't particularly specifically call those out. And so um, just understanding that there are two different kinds of requirements in those laws and you should be aware of both of them because they do provide a slightly different perspective on the experience and the work. Right, that makes sense. Um, there was a recent headline around the Department of Justice and some new standards that they released. Would you uh, care to summarize, comment on um, that that ruling or or decision? Um, not sure. I want to you know on the ruling itself. Uh, it's welcome to see. Certainly, okay, um, great. it's fantastic. Great. They are pointing to I believe we CAG two O. Um, and again, pointing, mm -hmm. it, that's pretty consistent across the U.S. that we CAG two O is the the basis. Uh, we did see, I think early on when the White House came out, them starting that process in this administration towards WCAG 2.1, but that isn't accepted across the legal legal space yet. Interesting. So can you give me just a few search terms that people might want to use that if they want to Google and find out more information about these kinds of standards to apply to their technology? Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll paste a link into comments if that that is helpful. Uh, the W3C does have a link to most of the policies internationally, and so you can get there. It needs to be updated, but it's a great starting point, so I'll I'll paste that in in a second. Um, also, you can search WCAG. You can search the country name plus um, accessibility law, and typically you will come up with yeah. uh, that particular country's standard and, and information. Yeah, of course, it's pronounced WCAG, but it's actually W-C-A-G. It so is. I wanted to point, to point that out. There's no E in there. So um, great. So um, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about uh, assistive technology, and this is probably where we'll open it up to, to everyone. And I want to talk about assistive technology as well as its limitations. Um, first of all, we should probably talk to, I, I think Judy could probably help us understand the kind of assistive technology that's out there and most widely adopted. And, um, and then we can talk about limitations and, and how to approach these things. Yeah, so there, there are many different kinds of assistive technology. I mean, the funny thing is, many of us already have things that we wouldn't necessarily consider technology, but we have them. So like I wear contacts and I use reading glasses. That is a form of assistive technology. Um, if you're using a screen reader, for example, that is a form of assistive technology or a um, speech to text translator. There's, there's lots of different tech that's out there. The idea is sort of hearkening back to what Crystal was saying earlier, you have individuals who have specific disabilities. And then based upon those disabilities, there are different kinds of technologies that can be used that enable them to be able to engage with all of these wonderful digital environments that we've created in a way that is supposed to facilitate their ability to work and to live. So a lot of that tends to be around things that will read for people, like a um, like a, a, a reader technology, but then it's also going to be things that enable them to be able to speak their commands 
So those would be some of the ones that I think of off the top of my head. I mean, we have folks like Gina Bo Walker, who tends to write about this a ton and who's actually been writing about assistive technology. She is currently out on maternity leave and I'm very happy for her, but um, I would recommend pointing to some of her research. Can we put her name in the chat somewhere? Yes, absolutely. Okay, I can definitely do that. Um, and she'll be back in the fall and ready to talk to people. And once I can figure out how to put something in the chat, I promise I will. <laughs> right. Um, okay, great. So then let's talk about sort of the limitations. So uh, yeah. obviously assistive technology can't possibly apply to all kinds of disabilities. So intersectionally, like what, what are we, what, what are we missing and, and how do you design for things that you don't have assistive technology for? Anyone can take that question. So I, I would love to pop in with just one and then I, I want to hear what Crystal and Rochelle have to say as well. One of the things that I've been seeing more and more of is around neurodiversity and the fact that we have individuals who can be overwhelmed by the volume of information that we put onto digital interfaces and particularly websites. Um, I just completed review of government mobile websites and we'll be publishing that fairly soon. And you know, kind of spoiler alert, government agencies in the US and Canada tend to put a lot of information on every single page. And for an individual who has trouble concentrating, focusing, or needs just a smaller amount of information put in front of them, that can be overwhelming to the point where they are unable to interact with that interface. So when we think about some of the, the disabilities, some of them are, are much more obvious than others. Like I have difficulty seeing, I can't hear, um, I, I have issues with mobility, so I need something that will help me navigate without having to use my hands. Those are things that are very, very obvious, but the things that we cannot physically see, we need to be accounting for those as well. Yeah. So I'll kind of tie in with that a little bit. One is I'll, I'll get a link to you all for making content usable with or for people with con uh, cognitive and learning disabilities, which is a informative, not a normative standard uh, that the W3C put out. So it's not a standard, but it's there to help. And it addresses a lot of the cognitive challenges and has best practices for supporting people with cognitive disabilities that really um, is missing in the WCAG standards as a whole right now. Um, tied to that and going back to the original question, I do think there are a number of disabilities that don't benefit from having assistive technology to help them. And so it really does rely on the designer to take it into account. It relies on the developer to make sure they're coding correctly. And even for people with assistive technology, the code has to be right. If you've created a site that the keyboard focus doesn't work on, there it's really very little that can be done to make that accessible until you fix the code. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, like I, for me, it's, I think one of the, the biggest things that can be done is making sure that you are bringing um, disabled people in to your design processes when you're building out things to get, you know, because I, you know, assistive technology is great. And I, I mean, I use, you know, a screen reader um, sometimes and things like that. It, and, but sometimes, I, you know, I, I will go to a, you know, a site or, or use an application. And though I am a part, you know, kind of part-time screen reader user, sometimes if things were like, say, um, if they knew about like, you know, really tested for like Zoom, like a magnification in there, I wouldn't, I could be able to Zoom versus having to jump onto a screen reader because I can't um, read certain things. And that's, and it's really important to make sure, you know, um, you know, user testing, again, paid user testing with, uh, with, people, <laughs> with disabled people uh, and bringing that into the, you know, as early as possible, something that, you know, we all will, <laughs> we all kind of say multiple times and you and everyone will hear multiple times throughout this session, um, you know, bringing in as early as possible to discover those things that, you know, you may not be, you know, you may not be aware of um, when you're designing and building out initially without um, disabled people um, and having those conversations. Right. We Do describe it as accessibility by design. Yeah. And, mm, and that's, yeah. that's the problem. Like if we think about all those test cases that you get at the very, very end of a process when something's about to go into QA and then somebody says, oh yeah, we need to check for this thing here. 
but it was never thought of earlier upstream and it should have happened. It's because the yeah. people who needed to be in the room weren't there. So you need to have people with disabilities who are part of the product teams, who are part of the design teams, who are then part of the co-creation sessions and the focus groups and all the research that's going into deciding what the product needs to look or feel like, how that service is supposed to work. Then they're part of the testing. They're part of those agile sprints. And then when you get to the point where actually writing your real, you know, honest to goodness test cases, you're testing for those things because you already knew what they were because they were already identified way up front in the process. If you're doing it as a bolt on, accessibility is performative and is not gonna yeah. work properly. It yeah. has to be by design starting from the beginning and all the way through. Right, right. So um, related to a question we've got in chat, one, one thing I wanna talk about is, is a little bit sensitive and this is also me as a layperson wanting to know, this can be kind of a sensitive conversation to have with someone. Um, if you want to try to pull in people uh, at a company like Salesforce, where there's, uh, I don't know how many, five figures, numbers of employees, do you put out a survey and say, please help us? How do you approach someone and say, I need your help with this kind of disability testing? How do you use language to encourage that kind of participation? So um, when it comes to, I, I think, again, you want to go, you know, um, externally, uh, trying to, you know, it, it's one, I, I think it is important to um, bring at like to make sure you're hiring from a very, you know, hiring people, you know, disabled people, not, you know, because this is the thing of, you know, kind of what I, I think there is, you know, when it comes to hiring people with uh, with disabilities. There is a lot of misconceptions and stereotypes and, you know, of, well, you know, the you know, pro productivity. And when you're hiring people with, with disabilities, you really are, you know, you're getting their expertise along with, you know, you know, and their, you know, and their experience, you know, um, you know, you bring all that. You, you everyone does. You, you're bringing your life experience into your work. You know, <laughs> and so, but at the same time, you shouldn't, uh, you know, rely on them to be. You know, if their if their job has nothing to do with testing, you shouldn't be relying on them to be a tester for you. So, and there are external. Um, Fable um, is one that comes up the, the top of that are you know that have um, you know. Um, um, people with disabilities who do testing um, for companies. So, um, you know, it, it's one of, it's kind of a twofold, you know, definitely making sure that you're hiring people, you know, regardless of disabilities, because really there's no, you know, there's no reason not to, um, you know, but at the same time, not putting that burden on, well, you know, you have a disability. Now you're going to, you're going to test, right. you're going right. to be our accessibility tester as well. Um, but, you know, it does, you know, but you're going to get that from, you know, I, you know, I, you know, in, in, the, in the past before, you know, I was at Salesforce and other positions, I would raise concerns of like, I'm like, hey, I can't read that or this is not, you know, I'm testing things out. And, and that was before I had a title of accessibility tester or something of the like, just that kind of my own personal experience I brought into, you know, into my job and, you know, and you know, and helped improve the platform, you know, that platform for the better. But, you know, again, but that, you know, it, it, you shouldn't have to, you know, I, uh, you know, I shouldn't feel compelled to you because it's like, hey, you only, it's like, hey, you only have one eye. How about you test this for us? <laughs> yeah, That's, that seems like that could get, yeah, yeah. Um, go ahead. Can I add on to that just briefly? It, it is not cost effective or time effective to have individuals with disabilities just confirm the standards that we already know. Um, it, you should not have somebody come in and tell them that you that you need alt text on an image, for example. It just isn't, um, use, it's not useful. So again, starting with those standards, making sure you're doing the checks and then bringing people in because if they're telling you, wow, this alt text doesn't make sense in this context to me, that's really useful information. But if it's not there to even evaluate, it's not as, as useful. But also to the earlier point, I think they we need to bring bring these people 
earlier in the process to help design absolutely the with with this uh at the base of the pyramid i think that's a great point great analogy uh the testing pyramid you know is a very understood analogy in the industry and i think adding the accessibility pyramid uh would be a fantastic uh, way to visualize this we will address oh. There we go. <laughs> Did we lose me? We yeah. did. Froze up ever so slightly. Sorry about that. <laughs> all right. I was hoping I've lost. Uh, I've had a little a couple of glitches here, but it's all been when you were talking. So hopefully, I won't have any more. Um, I don't know where I left off. Maybe it doesn't matter. Um, let's see. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this shift that we're seeing in the industry, and hopefully, I'll I'll be able to get this question out before I have another stutter uh, in the in the Wi-Fi. So. Um, we are seeing a transition where people are demanding accessibility, not only from the customer expectation, just from, but from what I perceive as a whole. Oh, the Wi-Fi broke. <laughs> I think we're just going to have to go again. rogue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Let's go rogue. Uh, I'll, I'll, how, about, how about I not prep my question? I just ask it. What is driving the massive increase in demand on accessibility and accessibility testing in the last couple of years? It's a large number of people who need it. I mean, there's there are over a billion people in the world who have disabilities. Um, so I, I think there, there's that. I think also um, we're seeing that employees are feeling more confident about speaking up and saying, hey, you put a barrier in front of me. I can't do my job because this system is inaccessible. And so we're seeing that's happening more with internal development and external development because your employees can't have a good employee experience, just like your customers can't have a good customer experience if they can't use the systems that you put in front of them. So yeah. I, I think there's there's a higher number of people who need the, the tools and the technology um, and, and need accessibility to be built in by design. And um, people are just getting more comfortable with expecting it. And the funny thing is I'm also seeing that Folks who don't even need it are looking for it as well, just because it's an improvement. Think of it as like the curb cut effect. So my son, who has absolutely no issues with his hearing whatsoever, loves watching TV with closed captions on. It just helps him assimilate the information better. And so yeah. then when I heard that there are movie houses like AMC that have said, we're going to commit to having a certain percentage of our screens that will have open captioning. So not even something where you need an assist. It's just there. Then... We, we start to see that there are folks that are being more thoughtful and more careful about it. So I think that then puts pressure on other folks. Well, why aren't you doing that? And, you know, I, I think there's, so there's this groundswell that's occurring and it's a really good one because we are all, as much as we may not like it, we are all aging. We're all going to need more help. And then as, as individuals are getting better about speaking up about their specific needs relative to their disabilities, then we see that there's that pressure to do something about it. Yeah. yeah. I agree. That increased awareness um, of, of accessibility and disability uh, inclusion and inclusion in general is yeah. really a huge driving factor. Absolutely. I, in, in every, without exception, every customer and every tester I have spoken to in relation to this topic, empathy is the foundation of the conversation, mm -hmm. not something as cynical as a fear of lawsuits. Um, but on that topic, what impact do you think that these high profile lawsuits have had on moving the needle? It, do you think it is partly based on that or is it more empathy? I, I may maybe naive, but I believe it's more about empathy. What do you think? Um, I, I do think it's about empathy, but I, you know, I'm someone who's, I just, I just tell it like it is and I'm going to be a realist. Some people, it's about money. It's it's always going to be about money, and that's their main concern. And so I, you know, I I do think for a lot of people, they see not only is you know just you know being inclusive is and having empathy is good, but they also see how making sure you you know things are accessible really does improve products. But some people, it comes down to that bottom line, and you know, so they see you know the threat of a lawsuit in, you know, cutting into profits, then they're like, oh, okay, well, maybe now we will do it, <laughs> Yeah. you know, yeah. you know, and versus, or, and sometimes it, even the threat of a lawsuit, but actually a lawsuit, you know, getting filed is what, you know, kind of prompts them into changing. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, it's like, 
um, that is what it takes for some. And, you know, I wish it wasn't the way, but that's, that is going to be, you know, very, you know, th that's just how it is for some. And that's why I kind of, when I talk to people about, you know, really when they bringing in accessibility into their company, especially for, you know, you know, especially for testers who are kind of, you know, tasked with accessibility. And then they realize like, ah, this is, this really needs to shift left of, you know, kind of formulating, um, you know, kind of arguments and, and, you know, and building up evidence of how to present it to people who are in these decision, like leadership roles of like, okay, if you, you know, if you, you're not thinking with your heart or your mind, here's your, you got to think with your wallet. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yep. What I think of is, is that um, there's so many people who need this and you would you would naturally grow your audience if you just offered it. And there's a chance that your competitors are not or that you'll be behind. So there's a lot of uh, promise to developing for accessibility beyond the empathy point. There, yeah, there's there are multiple business levers. So I one of the things that I write about is how to get customer experience people to think like it's <laughs> business executives who care about finance. Um, because that's how you win your budget. And the same thing applies here for accessibility. So we tend to bucket it into three major categories. The first is revenue. So what are the revenue opportunities if we were to make this customer experience better? But so let's plug in accessibility. If we were to make this accessible or more accessible, what are the additional possibilities? So who are we able to retain that we would otherwise lose? Who are we able to bring in that we otherwise couldn't have gotten? And you know what, what is the additive effect revenue-wise of doing this? The next bucket is related to cost. So what kinds of expenses can we reduce? So think of the people who are calling in, like there was an example from an interview that Gina had done um, that she shared with me, where there was a blind couple that wanted to purchase Christmas gifts for their kids. And they went through the entire purchase process and everything was great up until they got to the cart. And they had everything loaded up in the cart and the cart was inaccessible. And so yeah. they had to then call the the toy store and read out each and every SKU to be able to make their purchase. That's unacceptable. So yeah. think of, you know, that's a bad experience for them. Think of the cost. Every single call that you didn't need to take costs you money. So you can look at the cost there as well. And then the last bucket is what we refer to as um, risk or resilience. So this is that future proofing. And you can think of the risk of lawsuit. You can think of the risk of attrition. You know, your employees walking because they're seeing you're not living up to your, your mission, your vision, your values, or they're not getting what they need. So there are all of those big buckets, the revenue, the cost, the risk or the resilience. If you're focusing on those, you're going to do better. And like one little data point that I have that I can share is um, there's a, a B2B firm. So this is not going to be something where we're like, oh, this is super sexy, something retail. No, no, no. B2B firm that has multiple brands they implemented a design system and this design system included making sure that they were compliant with WCAG 2.0 at the AA level. And when they rolled this out, one of their brands increased conversion by 3.25 times. So when you see that people are willing to buy from you more than they were before because you've made it easier for them to do so, that writes its own checks. So it, it's focusing on those buckets because to Crystal's point, I mean, we wish everybody would just embrace it because it's the right thing to do, but sometimes you kind of have to pull them mm -hmm. <laughs> or show them the money and then they're willing to do it for you. Right, right. That's great. Uh, a great point about the cart checkout flow in particular, because that's often for an e-commerce company, that's the single point of, of risk, revenue and failure in their company. And if you're cutting if you're if you're having a phone call for every cart and then you're you're also not even knowing how many carts have been abandoned it's a tremendous amount of revenue so um let's move on to to practical in the last uh, 10 minutes we've got here um there have been some questions in q a and and i i wanted to know uh i think we've we've sort of hinted at it a lot all this time but how would we go about recommending how, how would we influence product and dev teams to start thinking about this as not just an annoying set of requirements to address this instructor thought but how do you how do you have those earliest conversations? So I I personally really do like starting with what they've already created and demoing it from the perspective of an individual with a disability. And I've seen it, you know, I've seen these beautiful, amazing applications that then proceed to um, 
have nothing show up for a screen reader, like nothing. Um, and I think illustrating that's incredibly valuable. Yeah, yeah. There is also, uh, there's there's a company called DQ, it's a good partner of ours, that makes, creates uh, what they call the Accessibility Empathy Lab that I wanted to plug a little bit because they're great partners of ours. And and they, they allow you to get in and, and sort of simulate from the user's point of view what it's like. Um, in, any other comments or experience with this? Um, so I think honestly, like the, the building of empathy through that demonstration is really important. Um, the other piece is also getting your own employees to talk about their experience. So when we've had Global Accessibility Month and, and Awareness Days, and we've had our own employees talk about what their experience is like. Um, one of my colleagues had shared that uh, she was having difficulty typing because she has issues with chronic pain in both arms. And she uses a, um, a speech to text to be able to document her notes. But when she does, then the sound goes down on <laughs> whatever she's listening in on, which means that she can't actually hear what someone is saying while she is typing. Mm. When, you, when you tell those stories, it makes it a lot clearer that this problem is affecting people. And I think that's where we get stuck a lot of the time. We think about users, we think about consumers. We have to think about the people that are at the other end. And when you make it real, you put a face behind it, it makes it so much easier for people to relate to it in the development environment, in the design environment and say, oh, okay, I'm designing for this person. I'm thinking about that person's needs. I, I need to rethink this. Right, right. I know for me, I, you know, coming, you know, my background is in quality engineering and, you know, I, and that's how I ended up getting into the accessibility space. And so, um, you know, very quickly, I went from just, you know, someone that's doing testing with, you know, accessibility to someone who kind of was, you know, leading charge for, you know, accessibility. And so one of the things I, you know, you know, I started to use is just make myself available. Yeah, as you said, bringing that that human component, the people into it. So letting you know my fellow testers and developers and designers, anyone asking me about you know, because I I think sometimes there is you know it it, it may not you know be you know there is a fear of maybe offending someone. It's like well I don't understand you know what what you know why this uh, would be a problem for someone with a disability or this particular. And so, you know, especially, you know, so I am, you know, being, I am kind of an open book when it comes to, you know, it, it's very apparent that, you know, like me wearing eye patch or, you know, when I didn't, like I, you know, I have visual impairments and being, you know, someone that like, how, do, why does voiceover or JAWS or NDVA scream at me when I open it up? And being, you know, being that that, that safe place for someone to, be, to ask those questions without any sort of judgment. And I'm like, it does that to me too. <laughs> and this is how <laughs> I've learned to deal with it. And, you know, really, um, you know, getting in there, and, but, you know, and, and, you know, you know, and, you know, really, you know, trying to, you know, demo the you know what the problems are as I said before um and um also the fact is is that it does take coming from top down um you know a lot of teams a lot of my experience a lot of you know developers designers testers they care about accessibility they want to do accessibility but there's only so much they can do um, and, you know, when initiatives are set by not them, but other people, it's really hard for them. To, it's really hard for teams to be able to to put, the, you know, accessibility as a as a main focus. Um, and so it it really needs it, it's one of those things that has to ha happen you know, in conjunction with like, yes, working with these teams to make sure they understand and know how to build and test for accessibility. But there's also that that component of having to work on, um, you know, the 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 tops of companies, the leaderships and, you know, C-level executives to make it a priority as well. Because if you can't, if, if it's not a priority from, you know, the people who are making all these decisions, you know, no matter how much a team wants it to, you know, wants it to be, it's not going to happen because, you know, it's like that or, you know, it's like, you know, it's, you know, I guess you can go rogue, but 
you know, that's not going to go <laughs> very well. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, talking about a starting point, um, Rochelle had a great answer to this in the in the chat, and I wanted to talk about it uh, verbally. Um, there's lots of different areas of accessibility. There's different kinds of technology, screen readers, magnification, high contrast, spoken commands. Where would you recommend starting? So within digital space, screen reader support is the most code intensive. So it's sometimes a place to start, particularly if you're you're coming at it from a development standpoint. I really like to work with teams though to integrate different checkpoints and different strategies based on where we are in the design process and development process. So I, I'm a big proponent of a design guide of some type because you can make a decision once, you can test it, and then you're just testing against the design guide. Um, but in the design phase, very much thinking about your color scheme, your structure and layout, your organization, your font choices, all of that, and testing that and moving to development. Um, and I always recommend a developer before they move it to a tester, test with the keyboard as well as mouse. Get away from just yeah. that. That's like such a small thing to win. But looking at more of the code-based checks at the development point, then at integration testing, if you have an automated tool that can do your 30% checks of what can be tested and then doing full standards testing at integration, but building it across that really does help. That's great. That's great. Anyone want to add to that? I think it was pretty comprehensive. I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. yeah. Kind of I know. <laughs> I, it's kind of one of those things I'm like, I, I, I that's agree great. With all that's of that. great. Well, well, getting on, yeah, me, me too. So, so getting on the the uh, more into the practical, I do want to plug a talk that's a little bit later today. It's 11:45 a.m. Pacific time. Dylan Barrel, the CTO of DQ, is going to be demonstrating how to approach automated testing automated accessibility testing using both DQ and the Sauce Labs cloud. And this leads me to the next question around, is there are there any ADA testing tools to perform testing the desktop and mobile applications, open source or licensed? And yes, th there is a tool called Axe Core, which uh, is, is an open source tool that is used to uh, assess sort of like, like Crystal said, the 35, the 30, 35% uh, kind of low hanging fruit on accessibility. And that has been integrated into the Sauce Labs cloud. There'll be a demo of that in a couple of hours. So I wanted to plug that. And then um, just uh, final remarks from everyone. I, we only have a couple of minutes left. Uh, so, um, oops. <laughs> I think you lost it me be a again. Virtual event, yeah, without Wi-Fi just, glitches. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, st anyway, starting with Crystal, uh, uh, let's just wrap up in the last couple of minutes. Uh, when people leave the keyboard, they leave SauceCon. What do they do? I, I mean, I think the first thing is just um, learning and uh, understanding um, about disability. Um, that I think getting uh, you can't. I, I, you really can't do like accessibility without understanding disability. And I think that needs to be the first step. I think, you know, it's, cause it's not just about code or, or, or design or, or, or content, you know, as you know, it is, I like to, it's about people. And so there are, you know, getting on Google and, you know, and just typing, what is disability? And, you know, and kind of, you know, going from there and really understanding, you know, you know, that, having that base of understanding really is going to help you, um, you know, with your testing, with your development, with your design, um, you know, and then you can go in and ask more of those kind of technical questions. Um, I mean, that's, that's kind of what, where, you know, I, what I did as, you know, as a, you know, as when I was a tester, a quality engineer, that's one of my things like, what is disability? I have a disability. I know people who have disabilities, but, you know, I needed a general, like, I can, I couldn't just use my personal knowledge. I needed to understand, you know, a broader, a broader sense of what disability is and how, knowing that, how do I, you know, make things accessible? How do I discuss, you know, you know, you know, really understand what is accessible and what is it for this particular disability, this, you know, and, 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 and the other. Yeah. Yeah. Judy. Um, I think sort of building off of what Crystal's describing. So once you've done that, then pick a project, pick a piece of code, pick a specific service or product and try it out with that. Um, I, I think the biggest mistake that people make is they're going to say, all right, we're going to turn over a whole new leaf. And then they try and turn over a whole forest. You're not going to be able to do it all at once and you're more likely to fail. 
pick one thing, one project that you can get your arms wrapped around, build a business case based on that for doing it more consistently across everything that you're doing. And then that way you have a much better shot of being able to identify the standards and practices like Rachel was talking about, where you can set one rule or one set of rules um, and you can prove the value. And if you're, if you're not proving the value, then figure out how you can get there because maybe your initial hypothesis was wrong. That sounds great. Rochelle, you want to wrap us up? I will wrap us up. Remember, accessibility is a journey. It is a process you are going to learn as you go. There are many partners out there who can help you on it, but just take that first step, commit to it, start doing all the research that we kind of talked about, and, and you will be successful, and you will see a lot of unexpected and exciting results from it. That's great. That's great. Well, I want to thank everyone. This has been a great talk. I wish we could talk for another hour because uh, I know we could. So, uh, but I just want to encourage everyone. Uh, we have some uh, Twitter handles to share, I think, and um, sure. just wanted to tell everyone, uh, enjoy the rest of SauceCon. I think this has been uh, fantastic and I hope that everyone can attend D Dylan Barrel's talk to see how this works on our actual platform. Thank you, everyone.